Hello and welcome to section seven point two. We're going to talk about、uh, protection, support, and locomotion、um, aspects of different human、um, systems, and we're going to start with the human integumentary system. Great big word, but it is referring to the skin.、Um, and here is a little diagram of. The different layers of skin. We're going to start by talking about that. The skin serves to、uh, protect, and、um, that's where we're going to start. So the very outermost layer of the skin is the epidermis.、Uh, the it's the exterior、um, portion, and the very exterior portion of the epidermis itself consists of dead cells. Um, and you can see this on the very outermost layer.、Uh, the epidermis、uh, contains several sections.、Um, the interior epidermis, right here, contains melanin, which is a pigment that colors the skin, and its purpose is to protect、uh, body cells from solar radiation.、Uh, every about every four weeks, all of the cells. Of the epidermis are replaced by new cells. So as new cells are formed,、um, the process of those cells replacing the old cells and rising to the surface、um, continues. And within about four weeks, that process、um, is complete to replace all of these cells. The very outer layer, again, the exterior epidermis.、Um, those are the dead cells. Those are basically sloughed off、um, and discarded. Those cells in the exterior epidermis contain keratin, and keratin uh, is uh, a chemical that protects the layers underneath of it from exposure to bacteria, heat, and chemicals. So again, it's just providing protection. The dermis is the inner, thicker layer, and right here you can see,、uh, whoops, right here, the dermis. The dermis contains blood vessels, nerves, nerve endings, hair follicles, sweat, sweat glands, oil glands. All of that is contained in this dermis layer. The subcutaneous tissue, this layer right here, is beneath the dermis. It attaches the skin to the underlying tissues of the body, and it contains fat. Which helps the body absorb impact, retain heat, and store food, and it contains some connective tissues as well. So, what does the integumentary system do?、Uh, it protects the body. We've already talked about that a little bit.、Uh, it protects the body from physical and chemical damage, from、uh, invasion by microbes. Those are important、uh, protection mechanisms. It regulates body temperature. So, how does it do that? When the body temperature rises, the small blood vessels in the dermal layer dilate, increasing blood flow, and then body heat can be lost、um, as that heat radiates out of the body. And the reverse process can happen when the temperature is cold; the blood vessels constrict, and heat is conserved.、Um, also, another way that it regulates body temperature is that glands produce sweat, and that.、Um, As that sweat evaporates, the water changes this, its state from liquid to vapor, and heat is lost, cooling the body.、Um, and that's a, an important feature of of、uh, cooling and、uh, maintaining homeostasis. Acne.、Uh, just a quick uh, explanation. Um, hair grows out of cavities in the dermal layer. Here's a, a little example of our dermal layer.、Um, Hair follicles、uh, are where this is a, a clogged hair follicle here, but the hair grows out of the hair follicles, and as the hair follicles develop, they're supplied with blood vessels and nerves. They become attached to muscle tissues, and most of them have an oil gland. This is supposed to represent a little oil gland right there. If oil and dead cells end up blocking the opening of the hair follicle right here, then a pimple may form. And that's what that is.、Uh, Uh, starting to be right there.、And、the integumentary system heals itself. How does that happen? If there is a mild injury
Uh, the deepest layer of epidermal cells divide to fill in the gap, but if there is injury deeper down into the dermis, um, there is a process that happens, and um, that process begins by blood flowing from the wound to clot and restore the continuity of the skin. Uh, second, the dilated blood vessels allow infection-fighting white blood cells to migrate to the wound, and then the skin cells beneath um, scab, the scab begin to multiply and fill the gap, and then the scab falls off, uh, revealing the newly formed skin. If the wound is extremely large, uh, dense connective tissue fibers used to close the wound may leave a scar. And likewise, burns, uh, just a quick uh, overview. First degree burns simply damage the epidermal cells. They usually heal quickly without scarring. Second degree burns uh, are what we refer to as damaging the epidermis and the dermis. They can result in blistering and scarring. And third degree burns destroy the epidermal layer and the dermal layer. Skin function is lost and even skin grafts can be necessary. This is obviously a very minor burn, probably a first degree burn. Aging. Let's talk a little bit about that. When aging takes place, um, the skin becomes drier because glands decrease their production of skin lubricating oils. Um, often we see wrinkles appearing because the elasticity of the skin decreases. And um, aging is accelerated by exposure to UV rays from the sun. Now we talked about the uh, human integumentary system, let's look at the human skeletal system. Um, the human skeletal system provides a lot of support. <laughs> so that's where the second part of this uh, section comes in. Let's look at first joints. Um, we're going to look at uh, four joints that are um, pretty important in the human skeletal system. The hinge joint, um, operates like this. An example would be the elbow. Pivot joint, um, the motion of the pivot joint is like this. In the leg, we see the pivot joint at work. Ball and socket joint, uh, the shoulder joint is an example of that. And a gliding joint in the wrists and ankles um, allows movement in, in uh, many different directions. So those are some examples of joints and how they move. Um, a joint is simply where two or more bones meet, and that's what's happening in all of these situations. Um, here are some other terms that are important to know when talking about the human skeletal system. Cartilage covers the ends of bone to allow for smooth movement between the bones. Tendons are the thick bands of connective tissue attaching muscle to bones. And ligaments are tough bands of connective tissue attaching bone to bone one bone to another. So those are important to remember when we're talking about the skeletal system. A little bit uh, more uh, concerning bone anatomy. When we talk about uh, bones, there are different kinds of cells in the bone. There's compact bone. That's the layer surrounding each bone. And if you look um, on this diagram, the compact bone is on the outside there. And it is, just as its name says, very compact. We have spongy bone. It's less dense in here. It's much more, uh, has a lot more holes in it. Um, that's the term spongy. And the osteon systems, uh, those are in the compact bone. And the osteon systems consist of living bone cells. And the term for living bone cells is osteocytes. Those osteocytes in this osteon system, um, they're represented right here. They receive oxygen and nutrients from the small blood vessels. So here we have our, our small blood vessels in there and the osteon, there's an osteon in our osteon system. Um, there's some here and here surrounding the blood vessels. Osteoblasts are cells that are potential bone cells. They secrete collagen, which is a type of protein, and that is where minerals are deposited, and the hardening begins to form new bone cells. And we call those new bone cells osteocytes. Um, a word uh, just 
to mention about the formation of bone, embryo skeletons are made of cartilage. And they go through this process of um, osteoblasts becoming osteocytes so that an adult skeleton is almost all bone. By the time um, a young person becomes an adult, they have um, most of their osteoblasts have been converted, converted into osteocytes. Okay, here is a diagram, and it is showing two kinds of bone marrow. We have red bone marrow right here. Um, red bone marrow is the production site for red blood cells, white blood cells, and cell fragments involved in blood clotting. So it's very, very important. It's found in the, the following bones, the humerus, the femur, sternum, ribs, vertebrae, and the pelvis. Um, yellow bone marrow, on the other hand, is found in many other bones, and it consists mainly of stored fat. Um, bone marrow contains somatic stem cells, um, not embryonic stem cells, um, as you may have heard of the term before, um, but somatic stem cells, and those can produce all of the different cell types that make up our blood. So it is routinely transplanted to treat a variety of blood and bone marrow diseases, um, including blood cancers and immune disorders. And one last note before we move on from the skeletal system, osteoporosis. You've probably heard that word before. It's the loss of bone volume. Uh, bone actually becomes less dense, and the mineral content is lost, causes bones to become uh, more porous and brittle. It's very common uh, with older women tend to um, experience this a lot more. Um, primarily due to the decrease in estrogen production. So that is um, the skeletal system in a nutshell. Now the last system we're going to talk about in this section is the human muscular system. Just a brief overview again. Um, there are three main types of muscle cells. And if we look at each one of those, let's start with the skeletal mu muscle cells. Um, and here we just see a, a drawing uh, showing what those might look like under the microscope. Um, the fibers of skeletal muscle cells, when we talk about fibers, it's basically long fused muscle cells. And those fibers appear striated or striped when they're magnified under the uh, microscope. Skeletal muscles are attached to and move bones. And um, that is their function. That's what they do. Um, the majority of uh, human body muscles are skeletal muscles, and they are voluntary muscles um, because the, um, their contraction um, are under our conscious control. So we call those voluntary. A second kind of muscle is cardiac muscle. Its fibers also appear striated when magnified. Here's just an example. Um, they are involuntary muscle, and that is because uh, their contraction are not under conscious control. They, cardiac, obviously they make up the heart. They are found only in the heart, and cardiac muscle cells generate and conduct electrical impulses necessary for that rhythmic contraction. And the third type of, of muscle cell is smooth muscle cell. Um, these fibers appear spindle-shaped under the microscope right here. They're found in the walls of internal organs and blood vessels, and their function is to squeeze and exert pressure on the tubes or the organs to move materials through them. Um, they are considered involuntary as well because con their contraction um, is not under conscious control. Now let's take a look at how skeletal muscles work. Um, skelet most skeletal muscles work in opposing pairs. And by that, um, we mean uh, the, this. Here's a, an example with the arm. Here is the, a bicep muscle on the front of the upper arm. When this muscle contracts, the lower arm is pulled up. 
However, when the opposing muscle, the tricep on the bottom of the upper arm contracts, the forearm is moved down. And um, most muscles work this way so that movement can be in two different directions. Um, here's a, a word about, um, a little bit more in detail about muscle fiber. Muscle fiber itself is made up of what we call myofibrils. Um, myofibrils are protein filaments that can be either thick or thin. The thicker filaments we call myosin, and the thinner filaments we call actin. And right here, um, if you look over at this diagram, here is an example of what we call a sarcomere. Sarcomeres make up the my myofibrils, and they are the functional units of muscles. This is an example of a sarcomere. This is also an example of a sarcomere. This one is relaxed. This one is contracted. And this is a diagram showing how muscles contract. Um, it's called the sliding filament theory. And the idea is that we have a sarcomere, um, a, a functional unit of muscles. We have myosin in here, and we have actin in here. Uh, filaments that make up that sarcomere. When signaled, the actin filaments within each of the sarcomere slide towards each other. So here we have the, uh, the two actin filaments, and when they are signaled, they will slide towards each other, like this in this diagram, to show contraction. While the myosin uh, filaments do not move. They remain where they are. But when the actin move towards each other, that shortens the sarcomeres and causes muscle contraction. And that is the mechanism behind that. And if you'll notice, ATP is involved in that. One last note dealing with muscles is that muscle strength certainly doesn't come from the number of fibers because the number of fibers of muscle that a person has is fixed um, at birth. Prior to birth, that is determined. Um, but rather, the strength depends on the thickness of the fibers and how many are contracting at one time. Um, exercise, and you all know this because um, you know that exercising and working those muscles makes them bigger, makes them the myofibrils uh, adds myofibrils and they increase in diameter um, because the exercise stresses those muscle fibers. ATP is very important um, in all muscle activity. Mu muscle cells are continually supplied with ATP. And you'll remember from our last unit, um, we, our bodies can either use aerobic or anaerobic processes. But um, if oxygen is available, the aerobic respiration will dominate. So uh, whether it's from anaerobic or aerobic, ATP will be supplied to those muscle cells so that they can do their work. Here are a few ideas for advanced proficiency. Uh, read through those and see if you can come up with something exciting um, to research. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in class.